Goya. We talked this week a lot about prayer, a lot about forgiveness. We talked a lot about being connected to Christ. We talked about uh, growing in Jesus. We talked about a lot of things. But as we talk to be one with God, as we talk about being forgiven, we get to the point where we say, okay, I am converted, I am forgiven. How do I get victory? You follow me? How do I take that gap? Because it's not enough to be born. You got to grow. <clears throat> and so how do I get victory? How do I get uh, of victory over my struggles? Because we are all sinners. I said last night, nobody is perfect except me and the politicians and nobody else. Sometimes it seems that everything goes wrong. For instance, I know I read a story, Robert uh, Charleston or whatever is his name in Virginia, in Virginia, sometime like in 1980s, he was in a great financial stress, need. And so he goes to the bank to get a loan. As he goes to the bank to get a loan, he talks to the financial officer and he says, I really need the money and I need it quick, otherwise I lose my school and I get out of my apartment, please loan me the money. And the guy says, sit down, relax. We need your social security number, we need your driver license, we need to check your credit report and score, we need to do this. And they have him go through, you know how it is, a bunch of forms, a bunch of paperwork. They get all his information, they get all, everything. And after they talk about one hour, he says, go home and come again next week. I don't have a week. That's the process, go home. He goes home after about a week, nobody calls him. He goes back to the bank, we need more papers. He goes home, after a week he goes back, we need more, you, you know how it goes, don't you? He gets angry, he panics, he takes a gun and goes to the bank. Now I want you to measure from one to 10, on a scale from one to 10, his IQ, okay? He goes back to the bank with a gun. I need the money and I need it now. Don't, don't push the button, don't call the police. They give him some money, he takes the money, he runs, and after he runs, he gets to the car, and he says, oops, I forgot the papers with all my information. They have my social security, my driver license, they have everything. So he runs back to the bank, I need the papers. They give him the papers. He runs to the car, by the way, that's not his car, it's his roommate's car. He goes back to the car, and he remembers, I forgot the keys on the counter. He wants to run back to the bank. Are you measuring his IQ? Okay. He wants to run back to the bank, but he hears the police car coming. You know, all the noise. Okay, so he says, I give up the car. He runs, he gets into the bathroom. He sees the, in, in a restaurant, he sees the police cars around the bank and he's trying to run and the police is in all area. He leaves the money in the bathroom. He leaves the gun in the bathroom and he runs home on back streets. He goes home, his roommate says, okay, I need my car, I need to go to work. He says, uh, 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 was stolen. His roommate calls 911. Are you measuring his IQ? Have you ever had a day when everything goes bad? You get out of the house, you step in the dog's poop, and then you go to the car, and you sleep on rain, and hit the car with your head, and then everything goes bad. Have you had that type of days? That's our fight with sin. Nothing goes ever right. When you fight sin, when you fight your spiritual struggles and you need victory, the struggle between the two natures, the human nature and the nature that God put in us at creation, that struggle is continually present and we live in these two worlds. We are Christians, as Paul talks to the Corinthians, and he says to the saints from Corinth, and then he says, you have problems. They are saints, sinners. Do you know what I'm talking about? They are saints and sinners in the same time. And this guy cannot get it right. The people in Corinth cannot get it right. The people in our churches cannot get it right sometimes, not all, just a few, it's not about you. How can you experience 
lasting change. It's not enough to be converted. It's not enough to go to church. It's not enough to be baptized. It's not enough to get forgiveness. How do you experience victory? That's the key. By the way, I should leave this down. Okay. How do you experience change and growth? How do you get that? Paul says, you know, if you talk about religion, I'm going to speak like foolish. I am better than you. Because I work more than you. I've been beaten for God. I've been in prison for God. I've been on the ship and on wreck for God. I've been in prison for God. Uh, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Uh, you know why minus one, don't you? If they gave you 40, they could not punish you anymore. So they gave him 39 to, to give it to him again. I was stoned. Uh, I was... Uh, you know, sleepless, hungry, everything. I am the big, the real deal. I am the champion. I am the best among you. I am the pastor. I am the holy one. I am perfect. However, the same guy, Paul the Apostle, says, I am not doing what I want. I do, I do what I hate. What am I going to do? Now, some people, some people say that he says that in the beginning of his conversion. I strongly disagree. He writes that towards the end of his life. Why would he do that? Why would he say that I still struggle towards the end of his life? Have you ever seen good Christians dying, ever? Do you think anybody ever will go to heaven when Jesus comes? Will anybody be in heaven? Yes. Any of them that died were absolutely 100% holy, perfect, not a struggle in their life, or they were some of them still struggling. And they will go to heaven. How do you explain that? The thief on the cross, was he perfect? Would he go to heaven? How do you explain that? Am I saying that you should not be perfect? No. No. What am I saying? You will see what I am saying. Just be patient. How can you be close to Christ and yet not perfect? Growing, yet not victory. How can you be saved? If you look carefully, in the Bible, all people of faith, no exception. When they are alone, they stand. When they get close to Christ, they collapse. Isaiah, in God's presence, collapses. And says, I am the greatest sinner. Ha, woe to me. John, in Jesus, when he has the vision on the Patmos, he collapses. Ezekiel, in God's presence, he collapses. Paul, on the road to Damascus, he collapses. Daniel, when he has the vision, he collapses. People that stand, they have not seen God. In God's presence, you don't feel that I am the champion. In God's presence, you feel that I am the sinner. Because you cannot see God and feel good about self. Therefore, the more Paul says, I am the chief of the sinners, actually it means that the closer he is to Christ. Because people that don't feel that way, they are still far from Christ. So what do you need? We talked about it. We talked about a few steps. We are going to quickly go through them again. What do you need? First step, confession. We talked about that two days and one day ago. Confession is the condition. The Bible says, if we confess, 1 John 1, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 9. If, in Greek, it's a conditional. If we confess, if, if you do your part, God will do his part. Your part to confess, God's part to forgive and to cleanse. If you do your part, God does his. Some people believe that they did their part, confess, but God didn't do his part, he didn't forgive. Do you think you are better than God? If you did your part, God will certainly do his part. How do you know? Elena says, you don't need to feel it. You don't need to understand it. God's work is not based on your feelings. God's work is based on his word and his covenant. You just need to believe. If you confess, God forgives. That's the first step. There is no change without confession because the healthy don't need a doctor. Moreover, people that don't confess, they try to excuse, to explain. And the more you explain sin, the more you excuse it. Because, hey, 
She said, and then I got angry. If she didn't say that, I would have kept my calm. Now, you cannot get angry <clears throat> unless you are an angry person. Because there is no bad water coming from a good spring. If the anger comes every once in a while out, it means there is anger inside. That means that you are an angry person. You just know to control it when nobody bothers you too much. Oh, I, I am not an angry person just once in a while. You are. How could it come out if there is no inside? If it comes out, it means that you have it inside. Therefore, the more we excuse, the more we explain sin and blame others, the more we try to excuse our own sin. And therefore, you don't confess, and therefore, you don't acknowledge, and therefore, there is no hope and no change. You need to stop blaming, explaining. You need to take full responsibility and confess. And say, Lord, this is who I am. I have anger issues. I have uh, gossip issues. I have Sabbath issues. I have TV issues. I have food issues. I have whatever issues. You cannot, you cannot, listen carefully what it says. Confession is necessary for forgiveness. If you confess, God forgives. For growth. The more you confess, the more God can work in you, make you aware and change you. And for worship, what does it have to do, confession with worship? Worship is not Saturday, 11 o'clock, I go to worship. Worship is every day, Tuesday, Monday, whatever. When you acknowledge God as your Lord and bow down before him, that's worship. I've not seen too many people changed in the church. They go to church every Sabbath and they are the same after 40 years. But I've seen people changed in the hospital. I've seen people changed in an accident. I've seen people changed in divorce. I've seen people changed in cancer. Because worship happens when you bow down and say, I cannot do it. You are God. You alone can do it. That's worship. Real worship is every day acknowledging God as your King and Lord and Savior and saying, Lord, I need you, please do it for me because I cannot do it. That's worship. Worship doesn't happen without confession. Worship is to walk with God, acknowledge God, obey God, and trust God daily. God's presence and grace continually in you. Recognize him in all things, acknowledge him in all things, and he will work for you. How does it happen? How does confession happen? You cannot confess unless you see him. When you see him, by seeing him, you recognize how you are. At the foot of the cross, you acknowledge how you are and that your sin killed Jesus. And then you confess. So there is no self-exaltation, no boastful claim on the part of those who walk in the shadow of Calvary's cross. Those who live close to Jesus understand clearly the sinfulness of humanity. And their only hope is in the merits of the crucified Savior. Basically, people that are close to Jesus cannot boast. They cannot say, well, you know, I did something. At least I am the pastor. I preach every Sabbath. I go and travel and sacrifice myself. I, I do a little for God. Everyone that thinks even one, not five, not ten, even one percent, I did something. They don't deserve grace. Because they did. Everyone that looks for some appreciation, they take God's glory for themselves. There is zero that you can take for self. It all belongs to God. Satan tried to take God's glory for self. And Ellen White says, and this quotation I'm trying to remember, I do have it in my cell phone. I believe it's in selected messages. That when we do what Satan did to try to take some of God's glory for self, we copy Satan's character. I don't remember the very words, but I do have the quote in my cell phone. Now listen carefully. The claim to be without sin in itself is evidence that we are far from holy. It's because you have no true conception of the infinite purity and holiness of God. The greater the distance between us and God, the more inadequate our conceptions of the divine character and requirements, the more righteous we appear in our own eyes. A view of our sinfulness drives us to him who can pardon. And we realize our helplessness and we reach after Christ. The more our sense of need drives us to him, the more exalted view we shall have of him and the more we reflect his image. God does not deal with us as we deal with one another. His thoughts are thoughts of mercy and love and compassion. He pardons. Basically, when we go to him, and acknowledge who we are. If we say we are okay, if we blame others, we never change. By the way, uh, I was driving one time. 
And uh, 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 this is confession time, okay? I was driving, and I was driving from Illinois to Wisconsin, and I got in uh, Rockford where you exit Illinois and enter Wisconsin, and it was an iPass or whatever, what, I don't remember. And as I was driving, I was in a hurry. I was supposed to speak in a church, and I was late, and so I was kind of speeding. And I get to the toll, and the lady ahead of me, it takes her an eternity to pay the toll. I mean, why don't you have your money ready? If you don't have an iPass, why don't you? Do you stay to find the cash in that moment? And she takes forever, and I'm like. And after she finds the cash, she opens the door, and the cash drops on the asphalt. And she gets off the car, and she looks under the car, and I hate her, and I say, come on, lady. And I blow the beep, beep horn. And she looks back, and she waves. Oh. And my wife says, calm down. What if they go to evangelism? When you go to evangelism, when you start speaking, you meet her face to face. Calm down. <laughs> my ears go red. My stomach gets pain. Eventually she leaves. Praise the Lord. Go. Please, go. And I get to the toll and I want to pay. And the lady says, you don't need to pay. I say, what? The lady said that she appreciates your patience so much. <laughs> She's running to hospital. Her son had a car accident. She's running and she's stressed and she cannot find the money and she's terminated. She doesn't know what to do. And because you are so patient waiting for her, she wants to pay for you. Imagine how I felt. And I was blaming her all along that she is not prepared and she is, and she is so slow. And, she, and who was the problem? So many times. We blame others for our problems. And then we say, I got to be patient, and I need to change, and then I want to change, and I know that I should change, but I don't have the power to change. So I go to God and I confess, Lord, here I am. Please forgive me, and God forgives me, and then I do it again, and then I go back to God. Lord, please forgive me, and then I do it again. What am I going to do? I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. My friends invited me to play golf. I know nothing about golf. Nothing, zero. I hate golf. I'm never going to go back again. I went <laughs> twice in my life, and every time it was a failure, and I was embarrassed, and I promised myself I will never go again. And so my friends invited me in Michigan to play golf. They were professionals. Me, zero. And so, OK, you see the ball, and you see the club, don't you? All I can do is fight, but I don't know how to play golf. And so they started to explain, this is how you keep your legs and how you balance. And this is how you keep your hands and your fingers. And this is how you rotate and you swing. And make sure that you don't use the whole body and make sure that you do this and that. And they explained for half an hour. And they explained, and then I repeated, and then they explained, and I got all the theory, the whole doctrine, and they explained, and I repeated, and they explained, and I passed it, and I knew perfectly what I am supposed to do. Here. You follow me? Here. And then I watched them, and I was confident that I can do the same. And then, and I dug a deep hole in the grass. I hated myself. I was embarrassed in front of everybody. I said, I will never play again. I will never go to church. I'm sorry, to golf again. I said, I hate it. And they convinced me to try again. So I started to go to the prayer meeting again. And then I knew what to do. And I knew how to do it. And I tried again. When I tried again, there was a pond. Do you want to know what happened when I tried second time? This is what happened. I feel sorry for the fish in the pond. By the way, my friend told me that he has a friend who lives by the golf course. And he collects every week a bucket of balls. He doesn't even need to buy them because he finds them for free. And so I hated the game. I hated myself. I was hopeless. I said, what can I do? I know what to do. I know how to do. 
I cannot do. You follow me? Who is going to deliver me? In fact, my friend noticed that I am so frustrated and so sad and so upset that to make me feel good, he told me how others do the same. And he started to tell me about others. You know, so-and-so did that, so-and-so. He not only that he lost the ball, but he lost the club. <laughs> I don't know if he got angry and threw it away, or he lost it because he, he didn't know how to hold it. But you know, that was a good day. My friend didn't find only a bucket of balls, but he found a club. That was a good day. Trying to change self. Trying to get victory. Going through the agony of changing your heart. Who can change a heart? You need to die. God doesn't fix. God cannot fix a broken heart. God doesn't patch a broken heart. You need to die to be killed and to be born again. And God doesn't fix it to have good and bad patches. God gives you a new heart. You need to be born again. Can you born yourself again? It takes a miracle of creation. You cannot do it. You need to say, Lord, I cannot do it, but you can make me new. Please kill me and give me a new life. So, I don't understand what I do. For what I want to do, I don't do, but I do what I hate. I heard that joke. I don't know, probably you have it in English too. People that get in the mud and try to pull themselves from their own shoes. You know what I mean? To get yourself off the mud, like a cat running after the, the, the tail. You cannot catch your own tail because the tail goes to the body, you know? And you can run forever until you get discouraged. Or you don't get discouraged and leave the church. You become a Pharisee and you smile in the church and say, Happy Sabbath, how are you doing good? How are you doing good? But you're not good. And so how do you get victory? How do you change your heart? Can you change your heart? Stop trying. You cannot change your heart. The greater the distance between you and Christ, the more you don't understand how you are. And the more you think you are okay. But those who are near to Jesus, they understand that they cannot do it. And their only hope is in the merits of the crucified and risen Savior. So let's, let's repeat. Number one, what do you need to do? Confess. How do you do that? You don't know how you are unless you look to Christ when you see him and his righteousness and his death on the cross for you. Compared to him, you understand how you are. So number one, to confess, you must behold Christ on the cross. You follow me? There is no confession without seeing Christ. If you see self or you see others, there is no confession. I remember playing ping pong. And uh, I'm not good in ping pong, but I like ping pong. And... Uh, and, and I was in Andrews, and I was bragging, man, I play ping pong with my buddies. And the classmate says, uh, okay, let's have a game. And in my mind, I'm going to terminate you. I'm going to teach you ping pong. I didn't know that he played in the, I don't know how you call it, the tournament. And he got at level seven or whatever. So I played a game, and, and he killed me every time. I was like, whoa. And I said, uh, you know, you probably play professional ping pong, yeah? Tournament. What level? He's a seven. And I said, seven? How many levels? And he told me like 10 or something. I don't remember. And, and I said, and you are so good? And he says, I'm garbage. If I play with number five level, they kill me. They murder me. And they, if they play with number one, they get murdered. And I said to myself, how low can I be if he's seven and he beats me so bad? When we compare ourselves with people, we still are not good. Moreover, if you compare ourselves with Jesus, in order to understand how you are, you need to put your eyes on Jesus, and as you see him, it leads you to feel how you are, and you confess. Well, let's move on. The heart is deceitful. By the way, the Bible says, cursed is the man who trusts in men. You or somebody else, regardless. But we look 
to him. We behold him like in a mirror. And we are transformed from grace to grace into his image by beholding. Ellen White says that we are transformed, changed by beholding. You need to put your eyes on him. I remember when I was a kid, I, I was small, two, three years old, and I was afraid of darkness. And I told my dad, I cannot sleep, I'm afraid of darkness. He says, get it out of the room. I said, how? And he gave me a spoon. I opened the window, and I started to get the darkness out of the room at two years old. And I said, it doesn't work. And he says, you don't get the darkness out of the room with a spoon. You get the darkness out of the room with a light. And he gave me a little watch light that you put in the outlet, a little light. And instantly, I was not afraid anymore. You don't get darkness out of your life with a spoon trying hard. You get darkness out of your life by inviting the light in your life. And so, this is the covenant that I will make with them. Listen, folks, we say the covenant is only the Ten Commandments. The covenant is a lot more than the Ten Commandments. When God gave them covenant, God gave them the Ten Commandments, but then he said, this is my covenant. I will give you this law. I am going to put it in your heart. You cannot do that. I am going to put it in your mind. You cannot put the law, write it in your heart. How do you do that? I am going to give you a new heart. Take the stony one and give you a flesh one. I am going to give you a country that is not yours. I am going to give you victory over armies that are greater than your army. I am going to give you gardens that you didn't plant. I am going to give you homes that you didn't build. I will do all of this for you. You cannot do any of it. Why do we keep trying to do it? God says, I, 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 I will do it for you. And what should you do? You shall be his people. In the Hebrew, when God gives them the covenant, he says, if you allow me to be your God, I will do these things for you. But you shall have no other gods. And every time we try to do something different, we have other gods. We trust self instead of trusting God. We worship self or others. Only God can do it. That's what God told Nicodemus. And so my friends told me, you know, you actually can hit the ball. I said, no, I give up. I'm going to give up all this baloney, all this theory. Nothing works. Look to the church. Nobody plays golf well. And my friend said, we know the problem. I said, no, it's just theory. It doesn't really work. And my friend said, you don't keep your eyes on the ball. I said, yes, I do. No, you don't. Yes, I do. Do it again. And I did it again. And they said, you see, your eyes are there on the pond, on the forest. Your eyes, you need to keep your eyes on the ball. I said, what's the point to look here when I need to hit there? I need to keep my eyes there. You keep your eyes on the problem instead of keeping your eyes on the ball. You keep your eyes on self. You keep your eyes on sin. You keep your eyes on problems. Take your eyes off the pond. Keep your eyes on the ball. Like Peter, when he took his eyes off Jesus, he went down. Keep your eyes on the ball. If they kept their eyes fixed on Jesus, leading them, they were safe. Every time you don't feel safe, it means you took your eyes off Jesus. People wonder, what can I do? To confess, you need to see Jesus. To, to, to believe, you need to see Jesus. To get victory, you need to see Jesus. So in every single step in the Christian life, continually, daily, as soon as you disconnect, you are done. John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. Disconnected from me, you can do how much? How much is nothing? How much is nothing? Then why do you keep trying? If you can do literally nothing, why do you keep trying to do something? Shouldn't we try to stay connected 24-7, continually, every second? Shouldn't we understand that as soon as we disconnect, we fail? What if Christians were connected to Jesus, like Abraham, like Moses, continually? Can you imagine Jesus living in us that way? And so, that's the reason we are changed by beholding at the foot of the cross, by beholding his character, without human effort... Without even knowing, we are changed from glory to glory into his image. As we behold. That's the reason God gave you Sabbath. Not that you don't work. Lazy people never work and they, don't, they are not holy yet. God gave you Sabbath that you need him. And being in his presence without you making effort or knowing, you are transformed like him. Wherever he is, 
He makes it holy. When he made Moses, he says, take your shoes off because this ground is holy. That ground is not holy. You can go there today. I promise you, it's not holy. God's presence made it holy. They built the sanctuary. The sanctuary was construction site. When God's presence came, they had to go out because their place became holy. God's presence makes it holy. Sabbath doesn't have 25 hours. It still has 24 hours like any other day. God's presence makes it holy. God's presence makes you holy. That's what you need to do. Instead of trying to be holy, you should try to get God's presence every second. And so, sin taking opportunity by the commandment, producing me all manner of evil desires. Who produced the commandments or sin? Read carefully. Who produced it? Because people say the law. Sin produced in me. Because, listen, when Gabe, our oldest son, was small, he would want to touch the fireplace. Oh, he looks so, so nice when he's red. Don't touch the fireplace. When you tell the kid, don't touch, guess what the kid wants to do? As soon as I turn my head, ah, I look, ah. I said, didn't I tell you? I was curious. Our dogs, Prada and Celine, I give them the same food in same plates, same amount. Prada goes to Celine's food and Celine goes to Prada. Come on. When I was a kid, my grandma had a cherry tree, the neighbor had a cherry tree. I would jump the fence and eat cherries from the neighbors because it was better. It was the same cherries. Why do we do that? Because my grandma told me, don't go to the neighbor cherry tree. It's not nice. It's not, you, that's stealing. Imagine when she said, don't go, my mind was, that's where I go. Because we people are so curious and never satisfied and we always want more and we don't understand that more doesn't mean better. Jesus means, Jesus satisfies. When you have Jesus, you have enough. Otherwise, you never have enough. So we keep fighting and trying and fighting. And You know what it means to fight sin? This is what it means to fight sin. I'm going to show you what it means to fight sin. Should I? Why not? Oh, come on. Are you happy if I do it? <laughs> to fight sin, to fight sin is to try to shake a can, open it, and then try to control it. You should not even deal. You should not even take it in your hand. You should basically put your eyes on Christ because Christ and Satan don't live in the same apartment. They don't like each other. When Christ comes in, Satan goes out. You don't have to deal with it. He goes out by himself. In fact, he runs. And we try to control the can instead of trying to invite Jesus. It just doesn't work that way. You can try forever. God says, I will do all these things for you. You cannot do that. But you need to understand that you need to keep your eyes on the ball. Beholding God. Hey, I did a mistake there. I took commas. Did you see it? Spelling, spelling, spelling. Beholding God, his word, his character, leads to realization how, how we are and leads to confession and repentance and need for Christ. Fixing our eyes on Christ, we have confession. What is the next point? Man, we have only 10 minutes and we need to go to all three points. Oh, oh wretched man, who is going to deliver me? Now, who delivers me? Read the next. Thanks be to God who delivers me. Who delivers you? How? By faith. Not by words, so you could not boast, but by faith. He who began, he will finish it. He is able to save the last one. He saved Rahab. He saved Mary. He saved the thief on the cross. He saved the woman at the well. He saved Paul, the persecutor. He can save you. You don't need to understand how. You don't need to work for it. You don't need to deserve it. But you do need to call him continually. You do need to believe. You don't try to understand in order to believe. You don't try to do in order to deserve. You need to believe in spite of your feelings. God doesn't depend on your chemistry, your feelings. God is the same regardless how you feel. God chose to die for you before you were born. He knew all your life, all your sins. He chose to love you, and he chose to die for you. And you need to choose to believe. And the Lenin Rice says, not based on feelings, but based on his word, we need to choose. It's a mind decision. I choose to believe. 
I know I don't deserve it, but I choose to believe. And as you say that, as you say that again and again, you allow him to work. <clears throat> Likewise, you also reckon yourself. What means to reckon? You consider dead to sin. You are not dead to sin. Abraham was considered righteous. He still lied that his wife is his sister. You are not righteous yet. You are, con you are this is only justification. It's not sanctification. You are considered righteous when you confess, but you are still a baby in diapers. You need to grow. And so, <clears throat> you are considered dead to sin and the life in Christ in faith. And you need to trust in him. Don't look to self. Satan wants you to look to self. And so, you should look to Jesus and believe in him by faith, by faith, by faith. And exercise and develop faith. We must talk faith, pray faith, sing faith, think faith, act faith, 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 faith. Do not allow doubt in your mind. Satan wants you to doubt Jesus. Absolutely impossible to be lost if you believe in Jesus. And absolutely impossible to be saved if you believe in self. There must be a power working in us to change us. And that power is Christ. So number one was you confess. Number two was you believe. Read carefully. Except a man is born from above. Now read next. Unless he shall acquire, uh, work out, it says receive, you don't make a good heart, you receive a new heart. You receive new desires, you receive new purposes, you receive new motives, you receive new life. Otherwise, you cannot see the kingdom. Start, stop trying to develop a new heart. You need to receive it. How do you receive it? I don't know, except that I have to believe. And every time I believe, he works. And every time I don't believe, I struggle. And when I believe, I don't see change today. And I don't see change tomorrow. But two years down the road, I look back and I say, he has been working in me. All those small things daily that I didn't know why they happen. Nothing happens by chance. Jesus is working. Looking unto Jesus, as we contemplate the cross, we are enabled to see his provisions. If men, ladies, you can relax, it's only about men, would contemplate the love of Christ on the cross, your faith would be strengthened. How is your faith growing? Listen carefully. How is your faith growing? Your faith doesn't grow when you look to problems. Your faith doesn't grow when you talk problems. When your faith doesn't grow when you look to self. Your faith grows when you look to Jesus. The more you see him, the more peace and confidence you have that, yes, he loves me. Yes, he is able. Yes, he is sufficient. So you confess by seeing him, and you receive faith and believe by seeing him. You follow me? So number one, confession by fixing your eyes on Jesus. Number two, belief by fixing your eyes on Jesus. You develop faith. What is number three? Because we have only five minutes and 28 seconds. Remain. And this is the key. We learned about confession. We learned about faith. But this is the key how you get victory. Jesus says in John 15, separate it from me. You can do nothing. And then Jesus says, abide in me. God wants to abide in you and you to abide in him. You remember the parable of the house built on the rock and the house built on sand. Do you remember? In Greek doesn't say so. The house built on the sand, it says potamos, does not sand. The translation is dry river bed. Basically, it used to be a river in the rainy season in March and October. And in the middle of the summer, there is no rain, is dry. The man builds the house there. <clears throat> when the water comes, the house is gone. <clears throat> and the house built on the rock in Greek is not on the rock, is not under the rock, is in the cliff of inside the rock. You need to be inside the rock to be protected from storms. You need to be in Jesus, and Jesus needs to be in you continually. 
abide. As soon as you depart, get out of the rock, you are struck. There is nothing. As soon as you are out of the rock, the human nature comes back and you go back in the pig pen. Salvation is not an event when you got baptized. Salvation, it's a process. <clears throat> the more you spend time with Jesus, the more you become like Jesus. And it doesn't matter if you are the thief on the cross here. I keep telling people in all my sermons, it doesn't matter if you are like me here or if you are like Paul here. As long as you are in Jesus, he is working on you and you are safe and saved. <clears throat> and you can be here and depart from Jesus, and you are lost, all your righteousness is forgotten. And you can be here, a sinner, and be in Jesus, and be saved. Because Christ in you, the hope of glory. You need to remain in Jesus, in the rock. Abide in me. Abide in me second time. Abide in me third time. He who abides in me fourth time. Four times in one Bible, in two Bible verses, four times, abide, 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 abide. So many times, hopefully that we get it. Thanks be to God, he delivers me. So how do you remain? How do you remain? You confess, you believe, and then you need for victory, you need for growth, for growth, you need to remain in Jesus. And Jesus needs to remain in you. How do you do that? By keeping your eyes on the captain of your salvation. Like, like Paul, he says, I forget what is behind, I run for the goal ahead, and I keep my eyes on, fixed on the captain of my salvation. And doesn't matter what happens, I'm not going to take my eyes off him. You can talk to me, I'm not going to turn my head. A profession of religion places men in the church, but the character, listen, and come to show whether they are in continual connection with Christ. <clears throat> I need to jump, I need to finish because I need to catch a plane. We need to take our minds off the other things. We need to dwell about Jesus, upon Jesus. We need to contemplate Jesus, his mercy, merciless and his goodness and his love. And we need to dwell on those things not on the temporal things, not on the earthly things, but we need to focus on Jesus. We need to keep our eyes on the ball. I need to finish, folks. So number three, remain in Jesus. Fix your eyes on him, and as long as you keep looking at him, you will remain in him. I'm going to close with this story. I don't know if you know who she is. Her name is Ruby Bridges. She was an African-American first child to ever go to a white elementary school, William Franz Elementary School in Louisiana, 1966. She was seven years old. When she went to the school, crowds gathered and started to scream and call names and spit and throw rocks and curse and protest. At home, she got home and she talked to the parents, Mom, Dad, why are they so mean to me? And the parents said, they don't understand yet Jesus' love. What should I do to deal with them? And the parents say, you need to put your eyes on Jesus. If you look to them, you'll get so hurt that you'll not do it. You'll not make it. But you need to keep your eyes on Jesus. They say, I have no value. You have the value of Jesus on the cross. He gave you his own value. The, on the cross, the parents say, Jesus said about those mock him and crucify him, forgive them because they don't know what they do. And you need to keep your eyes on Jesus and to pray for them because they don't know what they do. So next day she goes to school. They start mocking her. They start throwing rocks. The, the, the officers, the, the federal officers, the federal agents walk around her to protect her. And she is moving her lips. The agents, when people spit on her and attack her, She's moving her lips. She's moving her lips. And they say, agents, are you cursing them? Are you angry? I says, no, I am praying for them. What, 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 what do you pray for them? I say, Lord, forgive them because they don't know what they do. And I know that you love me because you paid on the cross. And I have your value because of what you have done. So, Lord, I am your little girl regardless if they like me or not. And I pray that they see you, so they understand you too. I am your little girl. At the cross, we receive this growth gift. 
as we contemplate Jesus at the cross we don't need people's approval we are satisfied at the cross we don't look to self we don't get discouraged we keep growing as long as we are connected to the cross there is no growth in human efforts how do you do that by keeping your eyes on Jesus turn your eyes upon Jesus look him is in his look, look look him in the eyes stare at him all the time stare at him until you fall in love until you are obsessed until you forget yourself love him with all your body he will finish what he started he loved you to the point that he gave himself for you why would he not save you why would he fail you he didn't get you out of Egypt to let you die in the wilderness he wants to get you on the other side if you believe how do you believe how do you confess how do you grow turn your eyes upon Jesus father in heaven please help us understand that without you we have no hope but in you there is no way in the world to be lost we are absolutely secure and in you, we get victory and growth. And we don't need to understand, but we need to keep our eyes fixed, glued on you. Please help us all from today on to keep our eyes on you. And every time we forget, remind us to turn our eyes back to Jesus, to turn it back to Jesus. Wherever we are looking, turn it back to Jesus. We pray in Jesus' merits and thank you, Lord. We love you. We praise you. We trust in you. We can hardly wait to see you. Amen.